tell you about a boy I know, raised on a farm in Ohio. He got tired of plowing corn, so he went into town and he bought him a horn. He got a- Welcome to the Brass Instrument Makers Podcast. We're broadcasting you from Berlin, Germany. Today is the 30th of October, 2020. I'm Jake. I'm here at the Berliner Tuba Workshop. How y'all doing out there? Everyone all right? You getting through these Corona Blues okay? Your 2020 is not a <laughs> complete shit show like, like it's been for the world. Mm. So anyway, um, here in the workshop, um, very often for us, we, we always have people coming in, asking questions, you know, want to discuss things, and we always think, hey, you know, it's a shame more people aren't listening, so this is going to be kind of like the the online version of what we do in the shop kind of every day. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about, a, I got a question from a customer I want to answer, I'm going to talk about a new product that came out, I'm going to um, whore myself out for a little bit here, even though I get no money for it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of an instrument that's been on my table so for a while that just went out. So so anyway, getting right into it, diving in. We have a question from a tubist in Sweden. In Sweden. Hey, guys up there to Stockholm. Hope you're doing all right. So our colleague in Sweden is a professional tuba player who has just or would like to, sorry, order a new tuba. That's awesome, bro. Congrats. Nice. So, our colleague here has the question, should I order the tuba in raw brass? Should I order it lacquered or silver plated? And his question is interesting because most people, they will follow this up with, what's the effect on the sound? The sound, the response, everything. Yeah, okay, yeah, we get this all the time. If it's silver plated, it's amazing. If it's raw brass, oh my God, I can't live with myself. No, I'm serious, like people really flip out over plating. But no, our colleague's question is something quite different. His question is more of a durability question. Now, of course, it has to look nice, you know, it's a professional player, professional sitting, you know, got to look sh- nice and, you know, chic. But his question is that if an instrument is lacquered or silver plated or raw brass, does that affect how long the instrument will hold up? And he means it very specifically in terms of red rot. Um, depending on wherever you're from, sorry, uh, red rot or auf Deutsch Zinkfrass, or in English, de zinkification. Basically, this is a chemical pro. Oh, okay, just one step back here, sorry. Real quick, brass, most kinds of brass is basically an alloy of copper and zinc. Now, what happens is uh, zinkfrass or red rot. Is basically where the um, there's a chemical process where the zinc is leached out of the out of the brass alloy, leaving only the copper behind. And you will see, like they say, red rot. You will see red spots everywhere. And eventually, these spots become patches, become cracks, become holes. And at some point, the part is no longer fit for service. It starts to leak, and all sorts of awful things happen. Um, it usually happens in the areas that have. Um, that are directly affected by moisture. It's much, uh, for example, sorry, the lead pipe, um, whether a tuba or a trumpet or a French horn, uh, the lead pipe, uh, followed by the, the valve tubing, followed by the main tuning slide, or on a trumpet, the tuning slide first, and so on. And it's usually a problem that affects older instruments, you know, 20, 30 years old, but we've unfortunately, the last few years, you see with, um, you know, newer instruments, this also happens. So anyway, the question is, getting to the point here, does lacquering cause red rot? And I, I thought, what? I've never heard this before. Uh, and I'm like, hey, man, what are you talking about? Like, the hell, you know? Like, And apparently he, he said that another maker had told him that, that lacquered instruments, that it causes the, the chemical reaction to speed up faster. I thought, hmm, okay. I never heard about that before. So, look, I'm a hand worker, you know, brass instrument makers, most of us are, are, are um, we're a combination of many skills, but, you know, we're not usually scientists for the most part. Um, although we do study a bit of metallurgy on the side, I have never seen anything in my life to tell me that lacquering an instrument causes it to rot it out faster. I suspect what happens is a lacquered instrument compared to a silver plated one or a, la- or a raw brass one, it hides 
the the rotting out spots a lot better so for example a silver plated instrument the red rot occurs under the silver plating and only when it finally breaks through the brass you will see bubbles on the silver or in a raw brass instrument because the, it's a darker color it's not so shiny your eyes don't pick up on the, those spots so easily you don't notice it until you actually really polish it so a shiny lacquered instrument you see everything much more clearly okay that would be my my first guess now I talked to someone who, who works in the metal industry and he told me that, uh, not to be crude, but that's fucking bullshit, mate. So in his opinion, that lacquer has no, no effect on, on red rot. So, okay. So along that theme, I only have one piece of anecdotal um, uh, evidence to add to that. Um, there is a, a manufacturer, a German manufacturer. Um, who makes a very nice piston valve F tuba, uh, quite a nice one. It's a bit big, you know, like most modern piston valve F tubas. It's sort of like a mini C tuba. And I know three people who have this exact same model, and all three of them bought these horns around the same time. And the interesting part is one of them is silver plated, one is lacquered, and the other isn't raw brass. So all three, right? And this was about maybe 10 or 12 years ago, I think. And all of them were bought around the same time within a year or so, if I remember correctly here. And just by chance, I happened to see all three of them last year, so 2019. And interestingly enough, they all had red rot in the same place. So lead pipe was rot, starting to rot out. Um, the first valve slide, main tuning side, there were some red spots. Okay, you know, take that as you will. That's just anecdotal in, uh, information. Could be irrelevant, but it didn't seem like the plating seemed to have an effect on it. When you think about it, the water is interacting with the brass on the inside of the tube, not the outside. It's true that brass is somewhat porous. Um, if you spray certain chemicals or oils onto brass, it does absorb a little bit on the surface. Or when you polish them, the polishing wax and these kind of things. But generally, I believe red rot occurs from the, from the inside out. So to answer your question, I don't think uh the how whether it's lacquered or plated or or raw brass i don't think that affects the um the durability of it now in one sense though uh, um, there is another issue to consider and that's um contact wear mm -hmm. so where your hand touches the instrument so for example um um you know when you play a trumpet or a tuba you hold the valve block or your thumb ring or or the tubes where you hold your hand it's true if the instrument is unlacquered you will wear through it faster um, a lacquered one or a silver plated one will slow down those contact points. Um, having said that, modern lacquer and modern silver is, is becoming piss poor thin. Um, I swear they just dip that thing in there and like pull it out in like three seconds. Um, I mean, it's really like the quickie of the brass instrument industry. You see like the like 120 years ago, like an old con tuba. Um, I mean, it's, it's like you can sit there and sand that thing all day and you still won't break through the silver plating. It takes some good work there. But... Um, um, modern stuff is pretty thin. So again, I don't think there's a huge difference. Um, people who have allergies and stuff, okay, lacquer, silver, you know, whatever, gold, whatever it takes to save it. That's that's a different issue. But um, in terms of hand contact, yeah, lacquering, uh, like the, the paddle assembly or your finger buttons, or, that's not a bad idea, you know. Not everyone is okay having green hands um, like French horn players or, or some tuba players with their raw brass instruments. It's, you know, so okay. So anyway, to our friends of Stockholm, I hope that answers the question. Uh, congrats on your new tuba. It's going to be fucking awesome no matter which horn you get. I'm sure you guys have great taste in tubas. Um, love it every time I go to Stockholm. Like Everyone has the most awesome instruments there. Um, but um, um, I'm sure it'll be fine no matter what you get. So, Okay, moving on. Very often as a brass instrument maker, you get all sorts of other workshops or makers with various products are like hey man this is the greatest thing since sliced bread yeah whatever okay you know you see all sorts of stuff like i don't know like heavy caps for instruments we all a lot of us we know what those are adding weight to an instrument um fancy stoppers for the slides i don't know extra long uh, uh, stopping rods for third slides on trumpets or there's this this one thing this funny french name la fa 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 you know some people banging on about that stuff but to be really honest, though, um, I, you know, over the years trying a lot of these different products out myself, I'm like, yeah, OK, yeah, I get it. I get it. Doesn't get me all, you know, all randy and stuff. I'm like, yeah, it's cool. 
you know, I'm gonna go practice now, you know, like it's that kind of it's that kind of feeling like, okay, it's it's cool, it works, but you know, not enough that I'm like flying off my seat. And uh, you know, for that reason that I don't usually offer these kind of things to my shop. I mean, we always have a few of them here and there. Um, there's always someone who's like, hey, I really like this. For me, it works really well. Cool, bro, I totally get it. Having said all that, um, I recently tried something a few weeks ago and it's a bit of a shame. I only tried it just for, for a few minutes and uh, we actually uh, wrote the company and we should be getting a couple more of them in to try, but we, they're just not here yet. So I, I at the time of this podcast, I, I don't have a solid sample to talk about with you. But um, there is a device, um, if I get it right, get the name right here. Um, it's called the TSE, Tone Stability Enhancer. It is made in Bavaria, yeah. So it is made in Germany. So, you know, you get some nice German quality in there too. Um, tone Stability Enhancer in English. Um, in German, it's called, um, it's called the Klangverstärker. So it makes your sound really strong. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? So yeah, so this is a device. It's like sort of like um, similar to the idea, I think, of a heavyweight cap, but without the weight. It's a more of a combination of adding a little bit of material and a little bit of pressure to a specific spot on the instrument. Uh, kind of like adjustable braces, but a bit more specific. It's, it focuses on the on the valves, I think, you know. And um, it basically is a device that screws between the valve either a piston valve or a rotary valve, it doesn't matter. And the piston valve, once uh, it's one size, it will fit any piston valve instrument, I, from what I understand. Um, but I, I haven't had one of those in my hand directly, so I can't say for sure, but I think so. And the rotary valve, once they come in different sizes, depending on whether it's a, a big low trumpet valve all the way up to a tuba valve, which is you know requires a larger piece. So anyway, this device basically screws together two pieces of metal to make the rotary valves kind of touch each other, to give them some contact. Um, interestingly enough, it has quite an interesting effect. So going along those lines, so somebody was here with one of these um, uh, almost, um, now it's October, I think sometime in September I saw saw one on a rotary valve trumpet. I took it off and I said, hey, very cool. I tried on my tuba, right? So I have a, a 1950s uh, Lignitone B-flat that I, that I really like, my Kaiser tuba. It's most of my B-flat playing that I do, the, well, what's left with Corona these days. But um, on that horn, it's great tuba, looks like hell, but plays great. Um, but one thing with a lot of Kaiser B flat tubas, especially if you play them, they they always have a bit of a fuzzy response with the two and three combinations, second valve or third valve. You know, you get used to it. You know, you blow through it, you practice. You know, it's okay. Whatever. You put a heavy cap. You put an overblow key on it. Whatever. You know. But anyway, I got used to mine. It sounds fine. The player can still hear it. But no one else around you notices it. You just adjust for it. Whatever. Right. So anyway, I took this TSA this TSE thing. Um, and I screwed it onto the valve. Uh, it's first idea between the first and second valve didn't do shit. So I'm, okay, this is a waste of time. But then I thought, oh, wait a minute, you know, okay, take it off, put it between the second and third. Oh, wow, that made quite a difference. And what's interesting is this two, three combination. So on a B flat tuba, so this would be a D flat uh, or a G flat, for example, um, those notes. Um, basically, the problem is not that they're out of tune. They're actually kind of relatively in tune, but they don't center so well. They, they always feel a little bit fuzzy around the edges compared to... Basically, with this thing on there, suddenly those notes lock in a bit better. Now, you can get a similar effect by, by using um, um, a heavy cap or or the, I think what they call the Le Frec, Le fra, 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 that thing. Yeah, that also has a similar effect to that. But the disadvantage of those is that they, they tend to cause the note to slot so hard that that when you move from the note, it always gets a little bit stiff. And this thing actually, this TSE thing, when I screwed it on there, I suddenly could center the note better, but I didn't lose any flexibility. It didn't get, it didn't stiffen the response, which is usually what happens with heavier parts and stuff. Not not always, but very very often is, is the case. So so I just wanna say shout out to those guys who make that. Um, we actually ordered some to try in the shop. So if you're in Berlin, you wanna try them, or you're in another shop somewhere in the world, just tell them, hey, this is cool, you wanna try it. and. Uh, Maybe it's interesting. So if you have a B flat tuba that has these issues, or a big C tuba or something, it's worth a try, you know. Um, so just just throwing that out there. So good job on those guys. Oh yeah, it's really discreet looking too, you know. Like um, some of those those gimmick stuff, it's like the the maker really wants you to see it. It's like, hey, look at this gold plated dildo on my Munro. Wow, it's amazing, right? Now this thing is you screwed on, and you're like, oh yeah, it's there. I, I didn't see it. It's kind of off to the side. So I like I like how discreet it is. So there's that. And all right then, moving on. So 
as the last part of the podcast, um, I just want to talk a little bit about an instrument maker that recently, until recently for me, was unknown to me. Um, uh, basically, we get all sorts of instruments in the shop here from A to Z. You see, at some point, you've seen everything, you know, but there's always something that you haven't seen, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I got a while back a, um, a British-made tenor horn, uh, a three-valve tenor horn in raw brass. Um and it's called Gisborne. That's the name of the company. So just to talk a little bit about Gisborne. Um, James Gisborne of Birmingham. The company was active in England from 1839 to about 1913. Uh, I'm just reading off online here on uh, Hornucopia. Uh, he established the business in 1839. It was located at 34 Cross Street until 1845. Don't know what happens then. And then 1852, they added Maker to the Army to the logo. So I guess that means the workshop got big enough that, you know, they started supplying the Army. So I guess that was the cash cow. Um, In 1864, it changed to Gisborne and Son. So I guess he dragged his son into the business without asking his son if he wanted to do it or not, which is usually the case with these. It was located at 37 Suffolk Street. Uh, 1867, the logo changed to Henry Charles Gisborne. I guess the son took over or... Someone with the same name. And 1875, it moves the name changes back again to Gisborne and Son. So I guess Henry Charles Gisborne's son then took over. And then from 1894, Alfred Hall Gisborne. Um, in 1902, it was noticed that the factory was located at Vera Street. In 1913, the company was succeeded by Peerless Coy. So the guy who took it over, his name was Peerless Coy. Like, it's maybe it's just like modern English, but who the... F- Fuck names their kid peerless. Like for those of you who are not English speakers, peerless is basically a nice fancy way of saying I'm better than you. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm better than you, Mr. McCoy. Oh, nice to meet you too. Yeah, hi. It's like I'm better than you, Smith. Strange stuff. So anyway, don't really know what happens to the company after that, but um, Mr. Coy bought the business or took it over, and uh, from then on we don't really know. But um, what's interesting is our our featured instrument how to say does not um, match exactly like what it says here on on hornucopia so i'm going to read it to you right now on the engraving on the bell of this tenor horn so it's a, a stamp that says imperial supreme so that's the model of the instrument so imperial supreme i guess that's the for the i probably higher trim level um, of models two HM forces two Her Majesty's forces so it's obviously a military instrument so I guess Imperial Supreme is a military model it says Gisborne Boisel and Company so it's not just Gisborne there's another name in there Boisel or Boisel okay makers at 14 Grays Inn Road London factory is Vera Street Birmingham England serial number is 13,000 and then there's a small number of three stamped underneath it and way above all this stamping and engraving, there is a very, in a different engraving style, there is um, adult school King's Heath. So likely this was a military instrument that at some point was then um, 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 written off and then ended up at a music school as a music school instrument then for to spend the rest of its life until by chance it made its way to uh, a professional trombonist here in Berlin. So... Yeah, so things traveled quite a bit in that sense. But anyway, getting back to this, Gisborne, Boisel, and company. So what is this Boisel thing, right? So, okay, who is this? So um, first of all, uh, before I go any further, I just want to say a special thank you and shout out to our our friend of the workshop, Louise Oakes, uh, a professional trombonist here in Berlin. Um, Louise is, I think, probably the closest thing there is to an expert on Gisborne instruments. She, I believe, has uh, some herself and has made quite an effort to collect serial numbers and do some further research on this on this uh, sadly forgotten company. So if you have any further questions to Gisborne outside of this podcast, if you write me, I will definitely forward you uh, onto her if you'd like to know more. Or if you have instrument uh, Gisborne instrument yourself, again, let me know. Um, we'd love to see pictures of it and, and also to help create a more solid serial number list. Okay, anyway, Louise, thank you so much. Um, you really saved me a lot of time like looking up stuff, so it's a bit fragmented, the information. But one of the coolest things that came out of this uh, about trying to figure out about Gisborne and Boisel and company is the University of Manchester in Salford, Manchester, in the UK. They have a 
online collection of brass band news. Basically, brass band news was a periodical uh, from um, uh, that they have from 1881 until 1955, and the university scanned all of these newspapers and put them online as PDFs, free for people to to peruse at their leisure. And within these brass band news, there are many references and advertisements to Gisborne. So. It's always Gisborne, Gisborne Sons. And then around 1903, there is an episode of the newspaper. Oh, by the way, everyone, I'll put a copy of the link of the Brass Band News in the comments below. So have a look yourself. If you're, if you're interested in British Brass Band history, d d wow, like really, this is fantastic. So, okay. Um, in 1903, there is sudden mention of Gisborne and Boisel and company. So basically, they combined resources. They, he joined, uh, Gisborne joined this Boisel or Boisel um, group. And... It's not clear what exactly for a manufacturer Boisel is. Maybe they were a French importer. I mean, because of the name, you think Boisel is probably a French company, but based in, in London for somehow. Um, who knows? Maybe it was the French connect. We, we just don't know. You know, you, you can extrapolate. But anyway, in 1903, it's now known as Gisborne and Boisel. Then after, if you look at a couple years later, say, you know, 1905, 7, 8, suddenly it's gone. Boisel's missing. So apparently the partnership didn't really work out. So, but one interesting thing about this, though, when it says on the, our tenor horn here, Gisborne, Boisel, and Co., that allows us to date this instrument, uh, as Luis mentioned uh, to me, we can definitely date it around 1903, 1904 maybe. So that's a pretty good way to tell us exactly when this instrument was made. So that was pretty awesome. So um, going along those lines, outside of um, uh, Gisborne, so basically in the, um, excuse me, 1903, number 10 issue, of the um, of the brass band news there is an advertisement for the curved rim mouthpiece for brass instruments patent number blah 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 for those of us who are like wow everything's all new wow great ideas amazing like for example if you've seen the wedge mouthpieces from canada beautifully made fantastic mouthpieces very cool worth a try but i always thought that was that was something very modern and then you suddenly realize in 1903 they already had this um and there's a, a huge advertisement talking about this curved rim mouthpiece. And um, uh, it, so, again, I will post this in the comments um, uh, in the lower section here. Just check it out um, in your own time. And it's quite it's definitely if you're interested in old brass history, it's definitely worth a worth a look through there. And that's the podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Um, if I hope you liked it, uh, please like subscribe. If you have any questions for next week, we're going to keep going uh, as long as we have time. If there's anything that you would like us to answer, any other questions, uh, please have at it. Um, you have any interesting products uh, you bring to our attention? Any ideas? Any any um, information? Anything along those lines relating to breast instrument manufacturing? Please, let's have at it. And we'll see you next week. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. himself a job with the hometown band, but he blowed all the music off the music stand. But he kept trying till he learned how to play, and then when the circus come to town one day, he joined the band and he rode away, a playing on his old cornet. Now ain't that sweet when he plays on his old cornet.